a long-term relationship with a group of indigenous communities. And with them, we developed the idea that transgenic materials would come to Mexico. And the problem was that when they come, nobody was there to tell them. So that's when we started thinking we should really prepare a laboratory with capacity to detect the presence of transgenic organisms. And that's where I was helping them, to set up that laboratory. And the person who came to train them was my student, David Quist. Uh, we were just training, and to train you would have to have a positive control and a negative control. For the positive control, he brought corn from the US. And from the negative control, we thought we should just use the local corn, which of course is going to be clean and wonderful. And the surprise came when the negative controls started coming out positive. That means we started finding transgenic materials where they were not supposed to be. The reason why our findings were so astounding was because it was thought that there was no transgenic corn being planted in Mexico at all. And, and people wanted it that way. The government, the local communities, the people who lived in the city, they all wanted to have it that way, that there would be no transgenics in Mexico. Why? Because Mexico is the center of origin of corn and the Mexican government Now we know the industry hired professional uh, public relations companies, propaganda companies, who at the time were experimenting for the first time with something called viral marketing, which is the idea that a PR company, a public relations company, will go into the internet and start spreading ideas around in, on behalf of the companies that hire them, but without telling people that they are being paid by these companies. So this company called the Bivings Group, they created two fictitious characters, two doctors, Dr. Smetashek and Dr. I forget. And they made up two names. And these two doctors went on the, on the internet and started spreading rumors that what we had said was false and that the paper was flawed and so on and so forth. And the way the internet works is that people really respond to each other's opinions and the idea started really spreading around that our paper was false and had been submitted under false and uh, maybe illegal conditions. Whatever the case is, because we don't really know to this date, um, Nature decided to print two letters criticizing our paper and also to print a very confusing editorial where they say, we don't want to take positions, but based on what we know now, we have doubts that we should have published the paper back then. This is a completely, completely uh, unheard of standard. The standard of an editor of a, of a scientific journal is that you print what is known to be right by the current standard and then if something is shown to be wrong that gets corrected by future publications you don't go and say i should have thought about it back then if i had known what i know now that is completely against the way we do science um, nature itself recognizes that they had never done anything like this in 130 years the whole history of the magazine so there was something seriously important happening that they do not want to talk about, but I believe, I am convinced, it was pressure from these industrial actors, industrial activists, who wanted to change nature's position towards this problem. The industry said, 
You don't need to worry about this because we have it under control. The control is really the question. And they had been telling the world that they really had control over these crops, that if they planted it, planted corn, transgenic corn in one field, that transgenic corn would not go anywhere else. So our discovery that we were finding transgenic corn maybe a thousand miles from the nearest legal transgenic corn field was a huge problem for them because it really showed very simply and with real evidence that they really did not have control. So they lost the claim to having control over these, over these materials. And from that point on, they started talking about coexistence. findings are attacked by politics and industry, all foods containing genetically modified particles disappeared within days from UK supermarket shelves. Pustai himself is still forbidden from continuing his research. <laughs> After that uh, explosion uh, in uh, 1998 August, uh, when everybody was uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, certainly in the higher echelons of how they were uh, talking about. Uh, uh, all sorts of nasty things about me. Uh, uh, we just took two weeks, uh, came here, and uh, nobody cared tuppence about or genetic modification or, uh, or uh, what I did. Uh, I was not a professor, just our part. That's, 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 that's what it is. And uh, that, that really uh, gave us a, a good res a respite, uh, it refreshed us so that we could go back and face the music again. Take, take care, it's uh, started to rain. And, um, but the weather changes very fast here. The most hurtful thing of all was that he wasn't allowed to talk to his colleagues, and his colleagues weren't allowed to talk to him. So whenever he entered the room, they went silent within seconds and wouldn't talk to each other, and of course they wouldn't talk to him. And at the same time, uh, they started to disappear one by one, leaving him on his own. So by the end of it, we took to the habit of having our lunch separately in my office. Arpad is not the complaining time. He will never tell anybody how much was he hurt by the handling of him by the art. It was really, really very hard on him. Well, Arpad and I worked together from 1990 continuously uh, on the same projects, and we worked together on the GM project as well. The only reason that he is allowed to talk about it, that he has been uh, given permission by the uh, House of Common, the Parliament, and the Technology and Science Committee of the British Parliament, all the others in the group, including me, and we are talking about 20 people, we were forbidden to talk about what has happened to the right, what sort of experiments did we carry out, what was going on at that time at the right. So we were gagged. And our gagging is for lifetime. Even the Secret Service, they gag people for 25 years. If I happen to live to my 70s, it will be well over that time. And I still won't be able to talk about it. <laughs> 